Thanks, Ben, for really what is a, an overly generous introduction. I, I so much appreciate it. Uh, I've had a fantastic day today. I mean, first of all, the science here is second to none. I, I felt like I was just drinking from a fire hose of one more interesting thing after another. It was really unparalleled stuff. And then being able to see uh, good, good friends and colleagues on top of that is really a special treat. So th this was just phenomenal. And thanks so much for the invitation. Um, ben pretty well explained what I wanted to tell you today. So should we just go to questions? Did anybody? Uh, all right. So uh, I, I may wander away from the microphone. If you can't hear me, uh, please let me know. But uh, what I want to tell you about is really our attempts, uh, some of which Ben touched upon, to try to develop the next generation of how we uh, isolate bioactive molecules. So uh, as all of you know, and uh, we have the August GNF director sitting in our midst here, uh, there's lots of these yellow machines all over the place. And uh, what they do is take uh, gazillions of small organic molecules and in little tiny test tubes uh, known as microtiter plates, uh, you do a, a bunch of functional reactions, either with cells or proteins or really whatever your imagination could come up with. And uh, in each of those wells, you test for compounds and you can either stimulate or inhibit or whatever you wish uh, that function. So uh, at the other end, uh, out comes some molecules. Uh, those are rarely intrinsically useful, these primary screening hits, but, but there's certainly a start on the way towards developing hopefully drugs and hopefully probe molecules, and that requires med chem and all of that. So um, there's a lot of great things about this technology. Uh, I'd be the last person in the world to, to say it hasn't been wonderful, but, but there clearly are some limitations. And uh, what I'm going to tell you about, and I think uh, I missed some animation here, uh, but anyway, what I was going to tell you about, some of these limitations are uh, pretty significant depending on what you want to do with this. So uh, a, a, an issue for academics, certainly, is the high cost of this. So at Scripps, Florida, at least, if you want to do a full screen deck with all the compounds, depending on your assay, it's going to be somewhere in this price range. And, you know, if you're GNF or Merck or something, that doesn't bother you. But if you'd like to, for example, drug a whole pathway in your lab and make probe molecules, then that really is a significant issue. Um, per perhaps more interesting scientifically is that usually the hits are of unknown selectivity. And this is a big problem, right? Because as academics, if we want to develop probe molecules, and especially those that might not be covalent binders, if you don't know what your off-targets are, you really run the danger of misinterpreting chemical genetic experiments and being fooled by the effects of off-targets. So there are ways around that. Uh, my, my great friend Ben has a, a you know, beautiful way with ABPP for certain aspects of this to, to try to track things down. But, but in, in the general sense, this remains a really important problem, okay? Uh, and then, you know, again, this may not strike most of you as such a big deal, but having come from a medical school, Southwestern, where the biologists want to do far more than the medicinal chemists could possibly handle, uh, the fact that these compounds aren't that useful and really require expert chemistry to make them useful, that's a bit of a downside because it introduces this huge dam in the, in the whole process. So what we started thinking about was how could we overcome some of these limitations. And um, one of the things we decided to do was to try to reinvent or resuscitate a very old technology that I had nothing to do with inventing. Um, this was done in the uh, early 90s by Kit Lamb, Mario Geisen, Dick Houghton, and other people. And this has to do with making uh, combinatorial libraries of, of peptides in the early days. Um, by a process called split and pool synthesis, which I'll tell you about in just a second. And at the end of the day, what you end up with with this process are little beads that display many copies, but of a single molecule. So these are so-called one bead, one compound libraries. And the very, very simple idea is you merely incubate a fluorescently labeled protein, or as I'll show you, fluorescently labeled cells. Uh, one could presumably do RNAs this way too, et cetera. And then you uh, somehow walk through all of the beads that you've screened and simply pick those that attract either the proteins or the cells that, that you want to target. So um, there's a lot of advantages to this, potentially. Uh, 
Um, first of all, and probably the most important one, is that it's very, very easy to demand high selectivity. So as I'll emphasize as I go through this, um, when we do screens, our target protein is always a small minority of the total protein in the cell. So you can pretty much recreate the cellular conditions by having an excess of unlabeled proteins, which are invisible to you in this assay. Alternatively, if you have specific off-targets that you're worried about, you can label those with a different color, conduct a two-color screen, and make darn sure that your primary hits ignore those. So this is really, really nice and very important. Um, it's inexpensive, and that's largely because it's a batch technique. You, you simply don't put one bead per well and then do functional screens. You do everything in a batch, you do a binding screen, and then you pick out your hit and characterize it. Um, and as I'll uh, emphasize in the middle of the talk, uh, this won't make too much sense right now, but it allows you to carry out different kinds of screens that I'll talk about, including this uh, uh, imagination that I have that I'm actually going to eventually do something important, which is a biomarker discovery project. So let me walk through this. Um, before I do, though, uh, you know, since this is the home team and, and you're all friends and everything, let me just be bluntly honest about this. And that is, uh, there are a huge number of disadvantages to this technology. And this is frankly why it was kind of a curiosity and, and uh, something pretty cool when it was first invented. But it's largely fallen off the map. I mean, those yellow robots are there for a reason. People didn't really uh, take up this kind of thing. Um, so probably the biggest problem is that it's really only been useful for peptides, peptoids, and other simple oligomers that are not the best starting points for drugs, okay? And, and that's definitely a problem. Um, a, a, another huge problem, and I'll talk about this in a couple of minutes, is that there's an extraordinarily high false positive rate in this technology. And that is beads that look absolutely beautiful at the screening step. They've got that nice halo or they've gotten cells. But then you take them off, you resynthesize it, and you try to get it to work in any other context, and it doesn't. You're hosed. And the problem is you've wasted an enormous amount of time resynthesizing those, characterizing them. So the pace at which you could work was really crippled by this. And, and then finally, there's some technically clunky things. For example, you have to uh, collect hits manually by looking under a low-power fluorescent microscope or maybe by magnetic collection, and there's problems with all of these things. So what I'm going to do during the course of this talk is to really try to reinvent this technology to minimize or eliminate these problems and maximize and take full advantage of, of the potential advantages. So before I bomb into this, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, let me just introduce you to split and pool synthesis in the context of peptoids, which are these uh, peptide-like uh, N-alkylated glycine oligomers. So this is absolutely simple chemistry. I'm always embarrassed talking about this in front of chemists, but here we are. Um, you just basically acylate an amine-containing bead with bromoacetic acid, then bump off the bromide with an amine, and there you go. Repeat as necessary. This works really well. Um, one does this on beads called tentagel beads that have a, uh, a, a very hydrophilic uh, polyethylene glycol surface on them. So you can do synthesis and screening on the same beads. They have a very low nonspecific protein binding capacity. Now to do split and pool, it's really very simple. What you do is you take all your beads, let's say there's a million of them, and if we wanted to make all possible dimers and use three amines at each position, you split into three tubes, everybody gets a bromo uh, acetic acid, but over here everybody gets a green amine, here a blue amine, here a red amine. You then recombine and mix all these, uh, everybody gets another molecule of this, and then you split again, everybody here gets green, blue, and red or pink, right? So at the end of the day, you get a one bead, one compound library. Um, this is uh, very easy to do. Uh, even molecular geneticists in my lab who have severe cases of rotavapophobia can make uh, a quarter million compounds in about two days this way. Uh, why? Because let's say you did six of these steps and used 10 amines at each position. That's 10 to the sixth. There are a million compounds. So this is really easy stuff. You don't have to be an expert chemist, all right? Um, the reason we're using peptoids in this work rather than peptides is that they are a, a little bit of a step forward in the sense that when you use N-alkylated molecules, they lack that very tightly held 
uh, coating of water that the polar NH bond has, and this allows them to permeate cells passively. So they don't act like peptides in that regard, they just act like regular small molecules. And then, of course, they're insensitive to proteases. Uh, the downside is that these are incredibly floppy molecules. They are the molecular equivalents of wet noodles, and we absolutely knew that this was going to be a speed limit going in. But what I'm going to do for the remainder of the talk is more or less ignore that for just a little while and use peptoids as an admittedly imperfect vehicle, but to develop some interesting screens and see how far we can get with this. And then I'll cycle back to talk about much more important chemical matter, okay? Oh, sorry, and one more thing before I go on. The, the reason that we're using molecules like this is the very nature of the split and pool means that you cannot know a priori what compound is on what bead. You have to figure it out at the end of the day when you deem a bead to be interesting, i.e. it's a screening hit. And there's simply not enough compound on these beads to do NMR or anything like that, so you're stuck with mass spec, essentially. All right. So that's why these compounds are the workhorses of this kind of technology. Okay, so uh, what can we do with this, even with these crummy little compounds, though? So let me focus first uh, on a rather, what's getting to be an old experiment now, but I still think a, a very good example of demanding high selectivity. So uh, we were interested in asking whether we could develop peptoid molecules that could have uh, binding characteristics that would be competitive with that of a good monoclonal antibody. And in particular, uh, competitive with the very good selectivity of a monoclonal antibody, not really having any off-target effects. So um, we decided, for reasons I'm not going to go into now, uh, to develop screens for cell surface receptors, and, and we're going to use VEGFR2 here as a stalking horse, but what I'm going to show you is pretty much general for any integral membrane receptor. So we want a very highly selective ligand for an integral membrane receptor. So what we do is to set up a binding screen. We're, we're not going to set up some functional screen to block signaling or anything like that. We are simply going to do a binding screen. And the idea is we take a cell type that lacks our target receptor, completely lacks VEGFR2, and we label those cells with green quantum dots that are appended to a peptide that causes them to be sucked up inside the cell so they don't contaminate the surface. So these cells glow green intensely. And then in the same cell type, we engineered a retrovirus to put in VEGFR2 at high levels and then labeled those cells with an internalizing red dye. So here we got two cell types that are basically the same except for the presence or absence of our target receptor. And what we then simply do is a panning experiment using a mixture of those cells against, in this case, a peptoid library of hexamers with, with this uh, irrelevant lead sequence. And what we're looking for here are beads that bind only the red cells. Because, of course, if they don't bind the green cells, they must have ignored every other molecule on the cell surface. And hopefully, we're demanding very, very high selectivity here. So that's the basic idea. And when we did it, uh, here are uh, in pictorial form some of the results. We got a couple of thousand beads out of a quarter million that looked something like this. There's clearly both red and green cells bind binding to these big beads. And we found only five out of about a quarter million that look like this. So either we get a really crappy library or we really did put a heavy duty selectivity filter on this screen or, or both. I suppose they're not mutually exclusive, okay? So we, we picked that. Um, th again, this is done manually under a low power fluorescence microscope. Don't drink too much coffee that day. That would be a really bad idea. And uh, of those five, uh, once we sequenced them by mass spec, we found out that all five turned out to be low micromolar ligands for the extracellular domain of VEGFR2. So it's just simple biochemical binding assay of this fluorescently labeled molecule to the immobilized extracellular domain of VEGFR2. And in fact, all five were very similar to this. So uh, it's a micromolar hit, that's fine. Um, VEGFR2 and most receptor tyrosine kinases act as dimers. And so we basically simply clipped these two together and were able to quickly get a 25 nanomolar ligand. Now, uh, you know, again, this ain't aspirin at this point. But on the other hand, it's also not an antibody. It's about 200 uh, times smaller than an antibody. So uh, that's now a reasonable affinity for us to play around with and at least address whether we indeed got the very high selectivity that we were hoping for. That's the point of this experiment.
And indeed, we did. So I'm only going to show you a smattering of a lot of data, but we essentially put a red dye onto that dimer and then used it like you would use an antibody. And the question is, you know, does it act like a good antibody or does it act like something you buy from Santa Cruz? So, <laughs> and uh, basically it, it acted like a good antibody. So what we saw is that when we probed cells that express VEGFR2, as is the case in panels A and G, we had this beautiful red halo uh, lit on the surface of the cells, and when the cells did not express VEGFR2, nothing. So, so this screen, which was probably carried out for less than $1,000, uh, it gave a molecule that is still, I think, the best and most selective probe molecule for VEGFR2 that's not an antibody. Um, I'm not going to show you the data if you want, it's in this paper, but it also turned out to be an antagonist. Uh, if you put it in a mouse, it actually works in an in vivo cancer model to block angiogenesis. And so this is absolutely a viable way forward to get very highly selective antibody-like molecules. But again, because the peptoids are so floppy, you have to kind of go big in order to get these nice affinities. Okay, another kind of screen, and this is uh, one that I've spent a, an inordinate amount of time on, uh, has to do with trying to use this technology to discover biomarkers. And so let me introduce you to the hypothesis behind this before I start to talk about how we screen. Um, and again, this is not an idea necessarily unique to me, although I believe in it, but lots of other people do as well. And the idea is the following. Let's suppose that you would like to diagnose a disease, especially pre-symptomatically perhaps, but you have no idea what kind of molecular biomarker you should be going after. Now, most people would of course try to understand the disease very well and figure out what they should be looking for, find disease-specific molecules. I've never been very patient, so I'd rather not do that. And um, what I'd like to do is to do some kind of fairly irrational screen and find a biomarker very quickly. So the hypothesis here is that if there are antigens that are disease specific, maybe the immune system will consider those as foreign, even though they're not, but they shouldn't be present in a healthy person. And as part of an immune response would generate pink antibodies, and, and we know they're pink because this is my daughter's favorite color and she made this slide. Uh, and the idea is that the level of these pink antibodies that recognize these disease-specific antigens would be significantly elevated in a person with that disease as opposed to a healthy person. So the whole name of the game, and again, this is not unique to me by any means, uh, is to identify what these are and develop an assay to measure their levels in the serum. So this is, again, a pretty simple problem. What you need simply is a ligand for these putative antibody biomarkers. And that ligand must bind to the antigen binding site of those antibodies. Otherwise, you're going to pick up everything, and that's pretty much useless, right? So um, most of the rest of the world assumes that if you need this kind of a ligand, the only ligand is the native antigen, so you're back where you started. We decided to try to find an antigen surrogate, or maybe a better word would be an epitope surrogate, by screening combinatorial libraries of peptoids to try to find something that would be at least good enough to engage these antibodies, pull them out of the serum, and, and act as a diagnostic. So, so that was the enterprise that we set out on. Uh, the screening protocol that, that we eventually settled on to, and uh, by the way, Ar Ari's lab uh, and some people in his lab helped us with this a little bit, and we've done some collaborations, um, goes something like this. Uh, you take a big combinatorial library, again in the early days we were using peptoids, we'll, we'll get beyond this pretty soon here in a minute. Um, but what you do is you incubate it with a, a pool of serum samples from healthy folks, control patients, so that you get rid of ligands against boring antibodies that you don't really care about. And again, you visualize those by coming in with a secondary antibody that carries a red fluorescent dye. So you get rid of those. And you do that a couple, three times to cleanse the library as best you can of ligands to boring antibodies. Then what you do is you take a pool of diseased serum for whatever you're looking at, and you screen it against the remainder of that cleansed library. Those hits are now your candidates for the antigen surrogates that maybe would be interesting, and you resynthesize those uh, and then somehow check them on many samples, either by ELISA or by microarray or, or by various things. So we had a couple of early successes with this. Uh, 
th this cell paper in particular kind of generated a lot of buzz at the time. But it, it became very clear to us very quickly that our initial thoughts on this were probably correct, but that the technology was really limited. So I, I'm going to um, summarize about two and a half years of painfully wasted time in a couple slides and tell you what the problems were and, and how we solved them and then just move on. So you'll hopefully take my word for this. Um, I mentioned earlier in the talk that one of the big problems with this technology in general is false positives that beads look really good at, at the bead level with fluorescence, and then you resynthesize them, and the ligands are horrible at, at best sometimes, right? And depending on the screen, those false positives can be half your ligands to the vast majority of them. Now, if you've got a defined protein target, let's say a recombinant protein, it's not that bad because at least you can track down who binds and who doesn't. But if you don't even know what your target is and you're just looking for needles in a haystack and serum samples, this gets very dangerous very quickly. And so we wasted an enormous amount of time trying to track down what ended up being useless ligands and, and it just, it, it killed us, it really killed us. And uh, a, a great postdoc in my lab, Todd Duran, finally figured this out. And what Todd uh, postulated is that maybe the nature of the false positives is that there, <clears throat> excuse me, is heterogeneity in the density at which ligands are presented on different beads in these populations. Um, on, on some fraction of the population, the ligands might as well look like a kelp forest, right? And on some beads that had much lower loading levels, not so much. And maybe what the false positives were, were these rare kelp forest ligands, where the ligands are horrible. They're just horrible. But when a protein enters that kelp forest, kinetically it has a very difficult time escaping. That's the idea. And so at the bead level it looks fine, but then when you try to use it for anything else, it, it just sucks eggs. That, that's a technical term we've developed. So, um, but the basic idea is that if, this, if these are relatively rare, these hyper-dense kelp forest beads, then it's a simple solution. Uh, employ a redundant library and only pay attention to the hits that you isolate multiple times because they are very unlikely to be dependent on a weirdo bead architecture. And that turns out to work. And so as trivial as this sounds, this has now solved a 20-year-old problem uh, in this technology that has just confounded everyone for the entire time, and now we know how to do it. So now we don't waste time, at least not on this. Okay, and then um, the other thing that we came to was a much better analytical system than ELISA or microarrays or anything. And this is basically our uh, homemade knockoff of the Luminex system, which many of you may be familiar with. And the idea is we take these Tentagel beads and using a trick developed by a, a fellow named Kit Lamb at UC Davis, uh, we uh, put on the inside of the beads a mixture of two different dyes. And the ratio of those two different dyes is essentially an encoding uh, unit. So 10 to 1, 2 to 1, whatever. And then on the outside of these beads, we display whatever ligand we're interested in testing. And recall that I told you that the outside of these beads are really quite hydrophilic. It turns out the insides are very hydrophobic. So the proteins don't see the dyes on the inside, they only see the ligands on the outside, which are then encoded by the dyes. So you take these little beads, you incubate them with a serum sample, and then you just pop them through a, a flow cytometer that reads the, the dye code and also reads how much antibody has been bound by your ligand via third color on the secondary antibody. So the cool thing about this is we can do up to about somewhere between 50 and 75 plex assays with this technology on one microliter of serum and we can now work very, very fast. So this again was an enabling technology and again this was due to Todd Duran, really great guy. Um, okay, so now that we've fixed some of these problems, we're going to go through and do this again. And I'm going to tell you about the results of, of a project that we wanted to cut our teeth with with this improved technology, and that's a, a mouse model for type 1 diabetes. So I, I think all of you know that type 1 diabetes involves an autoimmune attack on the pancreatic beta cells, wipes out your, your ability to produce insulin, and then your sugar levels get all messed up, etc. So this mouse model is a very good one. It's a spontaneous genetic model. And so we screened healthy mice and what are called NOD mice, non-obese diabetic mice, uh, past a redundant peptoid library. 
and we got about 150 hits out of this one redundant hit. So you can imagine how much time we would have wasted if we didn't know the redundant trick, right? So we threw away the other 149. This was the single redundant hit. And uh, using this fax assay, um, here's basically uh, what happens for a signal from the nod mouse, and here is the signal from a Swiss mouse, which is the control. So, so that works pretty well. And if you run this against a bunch of diabetic mice, you see that the peptoid does a reasonable job picking up above baseline uh, about 40 or 50 percent or something like that of the mice. The bad news is there are some false positives. So this represents off-target binding to non-diabetic antibodies. Um, so a, a, as a biomarker, this would be of limited utility. It, it's kind of mediocre, and maybe we could improve it, but that wasn't what we wanted to look at, at least initially. Um, we were hoping that the peptoid for all of its warts would be good enough to act as an affinity column, and in fact, that was the case. So we put it onto an agarose bead, we poured mouse diabetic serum over it, and lo and behold, we were able to isolate a, a very nice yield of a particular antibody. We then took that antibody and went fishing in both pancreas and brain extracts to ask if we would use that to identify the native antigen. Now, uh, you're asking why did we use brain extracts? M many of you may know, if you've ever worked with my mouse pancreas, it's a nightmare. It's kind of a diffuse organ. It's not like a human pancreas. The tissues are difficult to work with. But it turns out the brain expresses many, many, many of the same proteins as the pancreas. There's some mystical connection between those two organs. Um, and indeed, in both, uh, in both uh, uh, tissue fractions, but most obviously in the brain, we, we found a protein that was somewhere around 62, 3, 4, 5 kilodaltons. And when we did the proteomics on an immunoprecipitation, that turned out to be GAD65, uh, a protein that was known to be a surface marker on pancreatic beta cells. So that sounded interesting. Um, and, and the Luminex type assays look pretty good. We could compete binding of, of the diabetic antibodies to those guys with uh, soluble GAD65. So the proof in the pudding then is to ask whether GAD65 is, is a good biomarker, and in fact, it's, it's much better. So we uh, expressed recombinant GST, mouse GAD65, immobilized it on, on glutathione encoded beads, and did that same Luminex-like assay. You can see here are the control mice in black, and here are the diabetic mice in red. So this really works, and it really does appear to be one of the native autoantigens. So um, let me just pause here and summarize for just a second that even using these lousy compounds like peptoids, we've been able to close the circle in this unbiased program of starting with a search for antibody, uh, sorry, disease-linked antibodies, managing to get one, and then using those antibodies to go searching for a native autoantigen. Now, will this always work? Probably not, but, it, but at least it worked in, in this case. And so that's, I, I think, some real progress. But uh, as I've been telling you, the peptoids are really quite limited, and so we really wanted to start getting on to more interesting molecules to get higher affinities, higher selectivities, et cetera. So um, I'm going to tell you about a, a baby step we've taken in that direction, which is to modify the, the basic peptoid chemistry, the same kind of acylation and amination that I told you about before. But what we've done is we've created uh, uh, surrogates or, or substitutes for bromoacetic acid that have very, various elements in them that will rigidify the main chain. So uh, you can put in heterocycles, chiral centers, unsaturation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sometimes more complex heterocycles that are built in two or three steps on resin. And the idea is we're going to use these as a diversity element along with amines as a diversity element. And then if you start writing down structures that you can create this way, I mean, yes, they're still simple oligoamides, but now they start to look a hell of a lot more interesting, you know, sort of natural product-like, although my colleague Ben Shen slaps me every time I say that. But anyway, um, you know, these are starting to look a lot more interesting. And they're a lot more conformationally rigid. So let's see if we can do better with these.
Um, I'm going to tell you a, a quick story uh, about one of these, which uses simple chiral 2-bromo acids. And this work was done by Yu Gao, who's uh, sitting in the middle of the audience here. He's doing a, a postdoc here in La Jolla now and complaining about the high rent. Um, so uh, th this, this is nice, because when you build uh, peptoid-like molecules out of this, you've got a chiral center next to N alkylation, and that introduces very strong A13 strain effects, and it's been known for a very long time that, for example, N-methyl peptides are really quite conformationally constrained. In fact, some of these molecules, you can uh, make them and separate conformational isomers on the HPLC, which is actually pretty remarkable. So uh, you can see uh, evidence of this conformational restriction. For example, in black here is the CD spectrum of hexameric N-methylalanine that was created via this technology. Here's the crystal structure of this. And, and again, the whole bottom line here is these are very conformationally restricted molecules, quite unlike peptoids. Okay, so let's go back to the diabetes experiment and ask if we redo this, can we get something interesting? So uh, here's the design of a library that uh, Yu Gao and Todd put together. Uh, again, here's a common linker that's there for technical reasons, the beads on the right side here. And then A is a diversity element that is either of the two stereochemistries of the chiromethyl, one of which is encoded by deuteration. Uh, and we also plunked peptoid residues in there as well, and here were the amines that were used. And again, we did this comparative serum screening. Now, what popped out of this were things that were pretty interesting. Uh, here are, uh, here's one of the repeat hits that popped out of this screen. It's a molecule that has three chiral centers in it. Uh, at this position, there is not one. Um, I'm going to show you in just a second that this is actually a nanomolar ligand for the antibody. Uh, and I'll show you those data in a moment, but it, it's much, much better. Uh, here again, in that luminex-like assay is binding to nod mouse serum, and here's control serum. So th this is really a, a good probe. Now what's interesting is that if you alter the stereochemistry at one of those positions, because of this A13 strain, you're essentially turning a right turn into a left turn for, for the chain of the molecule, and binding goes to hell. Uh, that, actually, I misspoke before, I'm sorry. The red line here is this molecule with nod mouse serum. I apologize. That This blue line here is the control serum with this molecule. And then if you make the peptoid analog of this, again, binding is just terrible. In fact, in the peptoid analog, when you test it against control serum, you start to see significant binding. Now, notice that these y-axes are really quite different, but, but this is a, a bit of a troubling background compared to the conformationally locked molecules. So, so this is an enormous improvement. We purified this antibody by the same kind of affinity chromatography techniques, and we're able to do quantitative titrations with that purified antibody, and remarkably, that turns out to be a two nanomolar ligand for the antibody. So now we're talking. This is a primary screening hit, no information whatsoever about how to bias the library, and we end up with a low nanomolar hit. Okay? Now, truth in advertising, remember that this molecule is immobilized on a solid surface and is binding a bivalent antibody. And from what we know about avidity effects, I would surmise that this value is probably going to turn out to be maybe 30 or 40 nanomolar in solution, but that's still really good, right? Okay, and uh, these things are useful. Uh, here's that molecule KTD3, uh, where we look at um, nod mouse serum. These are diabetic mice. Uh, it picks up not too many, but it, it has a, a limited sensitivity. But most importantly, it gives no false positives, no trace of off-target binding. Same thing for another repeat hit, KTD4, that came out of this. And so if we combine this in a three-plex assay using GAD65, and these two, they're not peptoids, but peptoid-like units, we can actually get perfect diagnostic sensitivity and specificity, at least for these number of mice. So we're hopeful that after this long slog through technology nonsense land, that we're finally to the point where we can re-engage with human disease and really do something important with this technology. So again, this just summarizes what I've already told you, and uh, we're, we're hopeful that we've finally made a breakthrough. Okay, 
Now, let, let's turn to more therapeutic things for a couple of minutes. And um, of, of course, uh, we're going to start using these kinds of libraries to go screen against uh, lots of different targets. And some of those are going to be pretty obvious ones, some are not so obvious. Uh, I thought just for amusement, I might tell you about a non-obvious one because it's just sort of cool. Um, as far as I know, we're the only people in the world who can target the antigen binding sites of antibodies now pretty selectively and with reasonable affinity. So other than the diagnostic project, um, what else could we use this for? And it turns out there may be a therapeutic play for this. And this is in a disease called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So this is a weird cancer of B cells where some kind of unknown antigen uh, tickles a particular antigen-specific B cell and it grows absolutely out of control until it eventually forms lymph tumors and, and you die from this. So uh, what's also weird about this cancer is that it, it halts at the stage of immature B cells. These cells do not differentiate into antibody-producing plasma cells. So the situation in these patients is that they become almost monoclonal for this nasty pathogenic B cell, but there are not antibodies swimming around in the serum that are analogous to that B cell receptor. So the strategy we thought we'd uh, take a look at is instead of treating this disease as it is now, where you use a monoclonal antibody against the B cell restricted CD20 and kill all B cells, so that's you know, better than just poisoning someone, but it's still pretty non-selective. Could we deliver toxins or effector functions to the antigen-specific sites of these pathogenic B-cell receptors and spare the healthy cells, say, at an early stage of the disease? So th this would seem to be crazy, but, but we thought we'd take a shot at it, okay? So we uh, created a library to do this. Uh, this isn't uh, quite what I showed you before. This is like the vanilligus version of the kind of library I showed you before. These are things that are called COPAs, uh, chiral oligomers of pentenoic amides that were developed in collaboration with my former colleague, uh, Glenn Michelisio. They also are conformationally rigid because of these strong A13 effects. So we utilized, again, both stereoisomers as well as a peptoid unit as a diversity element in the construction of a former library and then utilize these amines. So that's almost 1.3 million compounds that took a couple weeks to put together. Um, we then screened it, uh, again in a, a similar way, against uh, CLL B cell receptors that we had cloned and expressed in a soluble form. So we cloned it without the membrane anchor. Screened against those and we got some nice hits. Uh, the best of which against one of these receptors uh, turned out to be a, a 90 nanomolar ligand. So again, not bad for a completely unbiased primary screening hit. So um, are these useful? Uh, it, it turns out we, we think they're going to be. So uh, in this cartoon, I show you a flow assay where we've taken those 90 nanomolar hits, they're the, the little uh, green stars here, and we've uh, affixed them to a dextran polymer to allow for multivalency. And then we've also dusted the dextran polymer with a fluorescent probe so we can follow it. And the idea is we then incubate this with, pa with patient-derived B cells. And the question is, will that conjugate recognize the antigen-specific B cells from the patient they were screened against as opposed to other B cells, healthy B cells from other patients? And they do. So let me just walk through this quickly. Um, this is the control experiment here. Um, fluorescence is on the uh, x-axis, number of cells on the y-axis. And you can see here that compared to the control, when you add uh, the, the compound over here, that's in red, uh, you get a nice shift indicating specific recognition of those B cells. Uh, when you do that with other B cells that display other antigen-specific B cell receptors, there is no such shift. And again, we have lots and lots of data. I'm not going to inundate you with controls, but suffice to say that for the first time I'm aware anyway, we've developed synthetic compounds that are capable of highly selective and avid recognition of antigen-specific B cells. Okay, now, is this going to be useful in, in medicine? Should we think about starting a company on this? Whatever. Um, and, and a critical question here is how personalized is this therapy going to have to be? Uh, 
because no two CLL patients have exactly the same B-cell receptors. The math of VDJ recombination just won't allow for that. But it turns out, through high-throughput sequencing efforts, people have found that about half of all CLL cases fall into somewhere around 15, 16 stereotype families where the B-cell receptors are highly homologous to one another. So the question is, can an antigen surrogate, like we're isolating here, cross-react over a stereotype family, but again, not hit healthy B cells? So uh, that example I showed you before was not a member of a stereotype, so we went and did this again. Uh, here's the design of this library. It had a little bit of a mixed backbone in, in this case, uh, again, around a million molecules. We did the screen. Uh, the best redundant hit in this case was about 120 nanomolar molecule. And now we do the same experiment that I told you about before. And indeed, we find that uh, these molecules are able to engage uh, CLL14 cells, which is the ones they were screened against, and have much lower binding to other antigen-specific B cells. All right, so CLL14, which was the target B cell receptor, is a member of one of these stereotype families. So now what we do is we take uh, the cells from other patients, but in the same stereotype family, same sequence family, and we rerun the fax assay. And let me just focus your attention here. Uh, again, this is the control with no fluorescence, and red is targeting CLL14, the, the receptor we screened against. And the other colors that you see here are other members of the stereotype family. And you can see that we're doing a pretty good job cross-reacting with those other guys. Uh, this particular one is a little bit off, but still easily frame-shifted from the baseline. So these are preliminary results. I, I don't want to make more out of this than, than I should. This is only one example. But it looks like we're going to get away with this. And it looks like these molecules are going to be able to engage uh, entire families of pathogenic B cell receptors. So where we are with this project right now uh, is asking whether we can use these molecules to deliver appropriate toxins and get selective killing of these cells, first in vitro and then in mouse models. So we, we shall see. But I think we've done the hard part, which is developing magic bullets. Okay, now just to finish the talk in about the last five or six minutes, um, what I want to talk about is uh, inventing the next generation of this bead screening technology. And uh, I, I showed you, for example, here a, a library that's actually relatively rare in my lab uh, in the sense that we utilize diverse backbone elements. That's usually a problem for us. And again, I, I want to remind you that at the end of the day, we have to sequence things by mass spectrometry. And the problem when you make oligoamides that have different backbone elements is that those amide bonds fragment in the MS with vastly different efficiencies. And unless you're very careful and you know a lot, uh, this can really screw up your ability to try to decipher these mass specs. So this was, was a really big problem. And so uh, I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. What we'd really like to do is to utilize all of this diversity and, and really make libraries like this with impunity. So uh, again, I, I, turned, I took advantage of the fantastic uh, conditions at Scripps Florida with, with all the collaborations, again, just like here, and got together with one of my colleagues, Brian Pagel, former uh, Jerry Joyce postdoc, and he and I decided to tag team the development of DNA encoding technology uh, as applied to these libraries. So as many of you may know, uh, a variety of groups around the world, and probably especially a group at GSK led by B Barry Morgan, has really developed beautiful ways to DNA encode split and pool combinatorial libraries. Now, I don't have time to talk about what they do so much, but I, I certainly want to acknowledge their pioneering efforts. Uh, but they do this in a very different mode than what I'm going to tell you about that's uh, pretty difficult and not so convenient and certainly doesn't use one bead, one compound libraries. So uh, let me tell you about how we adapted their ideas to our system. Okay, what we do is on these tenagel beads, we have a, a common linker that's not a, a diversity element that, that has a, an alkyne on it.
And what we do is uh, use this reaction. I can't remember who invented this. Does anybody know? Um, um, so, so we use Barry's uh, awesome click chemistry to uh, click on uh, what we call a headpiece. And this is basically a forked molecule that has a couple of oligonucleotides that when they anneal together, they leave a CC overhang. Now, we do this on a very small percentage of the surface sites on the beads. Uh, most of these things are not tagged. And we still have these amines now on which to build and do our chemistry. And the idea is that during the split and pool synthesis, Every time we do a chemical operation in organic solvents, let's say we are going to make a peptoid and we put on chloroacetic acid, um, after the completion of that chemical operation, we then switch to water or a buffer and we do a ligation reaction to put on a duplex oligonucleotide that has the appropriate overhang to allow for ligation and then an eight nucleotide backbone ID element that says this particular eight nucleotide sequence says that we put chloroacetic acid here. Uh, maybe a different one would say we put a COPA here, whatever, okay? So that's the idea, and you keep doing this over and over again until at the end of the split and pool, you have whatever molecule you're going to make, and about 150 mer DNA, uh, whose uh, in internal sequence encodes the chemical structure of that molecule. So if this all works really well, and now it does, uh, mainly due to Brian's brilliance, uh, I, really I had very little to do with this, um, then you don't have to worry about mass spec anymore, right? So that's beautiful, because not only does it mean that we can use all these elements, but guess what? PCR is a hell of a lot more sensitive than mass spec. So you're going to PCR up this DNA encoding element, and then you're going to sequence the DNA. So we can drop down from these beads we've been using, like 90 microns, down to 5 or 10 micron beads, which are about the size of a mammalian cell. And there's a lot of advantages here. Uh, first of all, these are so small they can pass through a flow cytometer. So now we can do our screening by flow cytometry, which is a massive improvement. And um, numbers count in combinatorial chemistry. There's about 2 billion of these beads in a gram. So if we make a library on a gram scale, we can make a million compound library and have 2,000 copies of it, right? So, so this now allows you to think very differently and do some different experiments. Um, we're just now engaging with this, and, and um, we finished evaluating the technology. It, it really works, and, and we're now deploying it. Uh, we've done a, a few preliminary screens. Uh, these are actual data, albeit kind of a mock screen, where we re-isolated a gnomon ligand that was doped into a library by fluorescent-activated cell sorting. So, so again, I don't want to grind on this, but this stuff all works, so we're really excited about it. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of libraries are in construction. Here's one that's going to be uh, coming off next week, I hope. It's, it's a library of interesting macrocycles. Uh, again, I could show you lots and lots of other structures, but these are now the kind of molecules we can access by the hundreds of thousands to millions. And, uh, you know, Jerry and I were talking over at GNF yesterday, and we both agreed that uh, for library construction, it's really good to try to get out of flatland, as you call it. And I, I think we're going to be able to very quickly do this with these kinds of building blocks. And uh, finally, uh, we're not going to be stuck with oligoamides anymore either. I mean, we've just done this because of simple momentum. But for example, I was talking with Jin Kwan and Phil earlier today. And guess what? All of a sudden, I can start to use their beautiful chemistry here because I don't have to fragment anything at the end of the day. As long as this exciting chemistry doesn't destroy the DNA template, we can use it, again, as long as it's high yielding. So anyway, as you can tell, I'm pretty excited about this. I, I think it's going to open up an incredible number of avenues for the isolation of bioactive molecules this way. Um, and then uh, we're going to hopefully develop uh, some new chemistry ourselves. As I mentioned, uh, Phil and Jin Kwan fascinated me with things I'm going to steal from them as soon as possible, uh, in, in a nice way, guys, really. Um, uh, I just wanted to put up here a slide from some chemistry that our, our late great friend Carlos Barbas developed several years ago. Uh, this, for example, is uh, organocatalytic chemistry that gives you beautiful stereo control of these kind of uh, uh, manic-like reactions. I 
think this is going to work on solid phase as well. So we're going to start to deploy all this stuff to try to make much, much more complex things. Okay, and this slide was out of order, but I do want to show you one last data slide. And, and that has to do with this issue of no matter how good we get, no matter how wonderful the libraries are that we might make, primary screening hits are not drugs. You have to do medicinal chemistry, right? So the last thing we've been super interested in, this again is the work of Yu Gao. It just came out in um, not nature, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, uh, this is a, a methodology that you developed that I think is going to really help and mesh with this new library chemistry very, very nicely. So what, what he showed was that you could utilize a method developed by a, a fellow named Manfred Auer at the University of Manchester to rapidly mature primary screening hits. And here's the idea. Um, here's a, a particular primary screening hit that wasn't very good that came out of a library uh, that was screened against a cancer target, MMP14. Uh, it's, it's, it's about a 20 micromolar ligand or something like that. Um, we got a lot of other hits, and when you looked at those sequences, he noticed that there were almost always uh, basic aliphatic side chains here, uh, aromatic side chains at these positions, and there was always a chiral center there, etc. So he made a derivative library that started to morph these structures in hopes of trying to improve the fit of those side chains, just, just like a medicinal chemist would do. Except what he did was to make 50,000 of those molecules simultaneously by split and pool synthesis. He then screened them. Uh, th these were not DNA encoded. These were still on big beads. But he screened them against MMP14 again and uh, took all the hits. And then at this point, he did put all the beads in individual wells of a microtiter plate. But these are only the hits, a couple, couple hundred beads or a hundred or something like that. I forget you. And the idea then is, again, we use Barry's click chemistry while the compound is still on the bead to put on a fluorescent tag. So now we've got fluorescently tagged molecules. And then we wash away the excess azidofluorescein, release the molecules from the bead, and these are filter plates. So we can now filter the tag molecules into a new mother plate. And now we do a plate-based fluorescence polarization assay titrating with our target protein, MMP14, and we get binding constants for every single one of the compounds that came out as a hit. And of course, if we wanted to, we could also get these data on however many non-hits we wish to characterize. So you get complete SAR information on the whole shebang in a very rapid way. And so he was able to get a second round hit that was about a 200-fold improvement over the primary hit. And again, this goes quickly. Right? So this is the power of oligomer libraries that, that have interchangeable bits and pieces. So, you know, again, we haven't really done much with this yet, but I feel like the technological pieces are now finally in place to really start to go do some interesting chemical biology with, with this technology. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you about today. Uh, sorry that was out of order. Um, I just want to thank the, the people who did this. This is a recent picture from a group party. Um, this is my backyard. Um, the, uh, the really critical people here, and I'll, I'll speak up so I can make sure I point to them, is that uh, Patrick McEnany, who's a postdoc who came to me from David Spiegel's lab at Yale, he's really been the driving force be uh, behind the development of these DNA encoded libraries. Uh, Mahosan Sarkar here did all of that CLL work that I told you about. Uh, and then this is Todd Duran, who really revolutionized all of the immunological screening. And uh, you, have you left by this point? Oh, that's you, Gao, oh sorry, that's you, Gao right there. Uh, and he, he did all of this, uh, this chiral and substituted stuff. So I really want to thank them for, for their hard work and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.